much, Andy. I, I love this uh, five things, the relaxed vibe, perfect start to the day. Um, and today I'm going to be adding to that uh, list with this book, Photographer's Eye. Um, just quick background of why I chose the book. Um, so at the beginning of the first lockdown, uh, there was a lot of talk about what people achieved during previous plagues. Uh, they'd say things like, did you know that Shakespeare wrote King Lear during a lockdown? And they'd say, well, you know, what what are you going to do? Uh, and I started writing, a, uh, started uh, doing a daily photo blog. Uh, so every day I'd go for a walk and take photos. And the next day I would choose one of these photos and post it online. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, you can see here this monkey on the left. That's basically me. It's like a monkey that can occasionally take an amazing photo. Um, you know, I, I kind of became totally convinced that I was a photographer because I was doing this daily photo. Um, but the trouble with doing any project like this over a long period of time is that you become aware of the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is this idea that Beginners are confident because they don't know what they don't know. Um, and the journey to expertise is becoming aware of what else is possible. Um, and The Photographer's Eye was the book that shattered my confidence. Uh, I found it kind of challenging and awkward and was disturbed by the possibilities it presented. Uh, and so I thought it'd be interesting to try and understand it better um, and kind of take revenge on the book by talking about it today. Um, it was uh, written by this guy in the middle, uh, jo John Zwarkowski, uh, and he was the director of photography at MoMA in New York um, between 1962 and 1991. Uh, and he's basically considered one of the key figures in convincing the world to see photography as a fine art rather than just a mechanical tool. Um, and the book itself came out of an exhibition. You can see this image on the right here, um, which he curated in 1964. Um, and it's basically, um, the book is essentially a, a exhibition catalog. So there's a lot more images in it than exposition. Um, but the book has lived on past most exhibition catalogues uh, by being a set text for photography students, which is how uh, my wife, who I believe is in the uh, event today, um, got it. And it was she who suggested that I look at it. Um, so here are my five things about the photographer's eye. Um, number one, the past must die for the future to be born. Um, so whenever a new medium arrives, uh, early practitioners tend to try and fit it into their pre-existing mental models. So when the car was invented, people called it the horseless carriage. And when photography was in invented, when the camera was invented, um, people made scenes that looked like paintings. Um, the association with paintings took a long time to die. And the image on the left here is uh, one of the very earliest photos from 1837. And it's basically a still life. Um, and the one in the middle is a portrait that kind of apes the portraits that um, people did with painting. Uh, and John Zukowski writes that the possibilities um, of photography were developed by non-artists. So silversmiths, tinkers, druggists, blacksmiths, and printers. Uh, uh, people who could abandon their allegiance to traditional pictorial standards, uh, or people that were artistically ignorant and had no allegiances to break. Um, no common traditional training, no academy or guild. Uh, and if you're of a certain generation, you'll know that this is exactly what web designers went through when we were learning HTML and the medium of the web. Uh, there was a lot of time when websites would look like a book or a magazine or had skeuomorphic elements. Um, and it shows that we had these like metaphors that we weren't immediately able to transcend. Um, 
And I, fe I felt like Swarkowski kind of brought this to bear on photography and helped me to think about other mediums. So um, the second slide, the second thing, uh, carries on from this, the road not taken, because there was all this frenetic, like early activity. Um, uh, it was difficult for art historians to develop a narrative about photography in the same way as they did with painting. There was like a kind of, uh, you know, a narrative of formal innovation. Um, you can still use old cameras and the photos can feel new. Uh, this image on the left is from 1865, but, you know, it looks modern, it looks contemporary. The eyes have a modern attitude. Um, the photographer's eye is not a chrono chronological history, but it is a thematic history. And by mixing up the timelines, Swarkowski kind of reveals strange connections between the different eras. And especially, I think, the paths not fully explored. Um, he says that the history of photography is less a journey than a growth. It's not linear, but centrifugal. Uh, and I think that's um, something that we should think about when we think about any medium. Uh, so AI and crypto, you know, they're quite big things at the moment, but I wonder how many uh, tendencies, how many things uh, are, are unexamined, how much weirdness is there that we haven't fully uh, taken on board. Uh, next slide. Um, when you first get into photography, people talk about things like the rule of thirds, but these rules are just rules of thumb. They're not hard rules. Uh, these are kind of rules of composition that have been established through convention and conventions can become conventional. Uh, I feel like the photographer's eye helps to kind of throw out this rule book uh, and ask us to think what would happen if we did the opposite? Uh, what does it do to the emotional resonance of an image? Uh, you can see these two photos here. The one on the left is by Bill Brandt and is uh, it's a nude, but it's a nude of an ear. So, um, you know, it's not the typical nude. Um, not everyone was happy with this approach. Tom Wolfe uh, is this kind of like waspish essayist from the 70s. And he said that, you know, Swarkowski made a virtue of what had always been regarded as photography's flaws blurring, foreshortenings, untrue colours, images chopped off. Um, and what Wolf is basically saying is that Swarkowski made uh, photography something that you needed to kind of learn. It had jargon. Uh, he seems to think that Swarkowski was becoming a priest of photography. Uh, but I think the best images in the book uh, do what all art should do. And that is they appeal to the unconscious, the kind of shiver down the spine that tells us what we like without knowing why. Uh, and I include this image of the boy playing as an example of something that has this mysterious quality. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so photography was an invention of the industrial age. And like any in invention of the industrial age, it's, it's very easy to reproduce things. Uh, whereas painting was difficult and expensive and people tried to record what was important, photography was very easy, cheap and ubiquitous and could re record anything. And I feel like uh, the lesson of curation is something that we always need to know, especially now when we have the AI tools that can create amazing things with a one line prompt. Uh, we still need the taste to decide what to create. And, um, and I think that's still the barrier to doing great work. Um, can you curate these uh, creations into a coherent series? Uh, can you do it consistently? This is the role of curation. Um, it also shows that, um, you know, when you have abundance, things can become boring very quickly. Like, I don't know if I ever need to see another picture of a Scottish lock, uh, even though I still take them. Uh, a lot of these photos are just done because, you know, we want to say I was there rather than being interested in photography. 
Uh, I read recently that there are so many images of the moon that when you take a photo of the moon on a Samsung, the algorithm doesn't use what's coming through your lens, but actually uses all the other photos it has on record to create a fake composite. Um, and I think this kind of mediated reality, um, you know, like for me, it, it kind of becomes boring. And Swarkowski's book, and I've, you know, I've got another set of examples here, uh, kind of opened my eyes to what was photographable. Um, you know, things aren't always taken from the same distance. They don't fit the, the frame in the same way. Um, and then they never say me. So uh, next, next slide. So I'm doing, I'm doing not too badly for time. I have got an alternative version of this where uh, I can cut out time. You're doing but, great. Just take your uh, time. <laughs> thank you. Um, so the camera is an instrument that teaches people to see without a camera. Uh, this is a, a quote from Dorothea Lang, who's a photographer. And, and for me, this is what the photo, the daily photo project did. And it's what reading this book did. It made reality a richer place. Um, and uh, the book is itself divided into five themes. Uh, so, you know, they could have easily done a, a five things about the book divided into that section, but I chose the things that resonated with me, but I just want to show of his five themes, uh, how that can help us to see reality more clearly. So uh, the first one, and I've got these as individual images, so you don't have to zoom in, um, is, is about the thing itself. Um, and what Swarkowski is trying to say here is that anything that's in a frame, in a photograph, becomes a thing, whether it's intentional or not. Uh, empty space can be a thing. Something that is covered, a car that is covered can be a thing, a mysterious thing. And if you go on to the next slide, uh, this is also in his collection of things. And it's, it's a kind of hotel room, but it's maybe a hotel room that doesn't have an, uh, a specific object that we're looking at. It has lots of things going on. There is things happening in the composition, um, but it's not a, a thing uh, on its own. So I think, that, I think that was interesting to think about how photography opens up reality in that sense. Uh, the next one he talks about is uh, the detail. And I think it's the, the symbolic quality of great photographs, how it brings out a mood or some kind of uh, feeling. What well, you know, I think this one of an elephant would be a lot less charged if you saw the entire elephant. And the next one um, is the frame. Um, and this is his sense of like, we choose uh, meaning by how we frame a photograph. And Henri Cartier-Bresson could have very easily uh, cropped out various aspects of the photograph, could remove the things that were blurry. You know, there could have been other things happening, but the fact that he didn't uh, brought out something that was far more powerful, I think. Uh, next one is time. Uh, if you go on Instagram these days, half of the content is video, and a lot of organisations have pivoted to video. Photography is generally a static medium, uh, but we can create this sense of psychological time it's pretty unique. Um, this photo by Harry Callahan draws out some of these kind of qualities. Uh, and I think when we apply this to, even if you're not a photographer, but, you know, web designer or, uh, you know, a, a writer, uh, you know, like, what is unique in what you're doing? What is the USP? And the final section of the book is about vantage point. Uh, and I thought this was really interesting because, a selfie, a classic selfie, is a specific vantage point that is determined by how long your arm is and the smartphone you're, you've got in your hand. Um, and I was thinking, well, yeah, what does it do if I put my hand up the way? And what does it do if I put it down the way? How does it change your appearance? Uh, if you go to the top of the building or lie on the ground, what does that do to reality? And I love this uh, Maholi Nagy a photo of a head just because it's 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 got this kind of awkward uh intimacy 
the um you know the gaze of the person is just it, yeah it's uh it's very strange and it, it kind of it speaks to my spine rather than my intellect um so yeah the the vantage point the exercise itself reveals that there isn't really a kind of objectivity in photography um just various perspectives on the world uh, and that is my five things so uh, thank you very much for for all listening thanks so much neil <clears throat> um huge round of applause for neil thank you very much speak <laughs>